You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. They have uh, Joanna Vaz de Castro, ORL. We're going to be talking about diseases of the ears, nose, and larynx, and sleep disorders. So, Joanna, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Hello, Richard. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, tell me, why why is this uh, your focus? What would uh, interest you in this part of the, the body or these parts of the body in particular? Well, um, as an ENT, uh, ear, nose, and throat surgeon, um, sleep and snoring is something that we see very regularly. And I'm not sure if it's like this in the States, but in the European Union, it's very compartmentalized. So um, the patients that snore and that and also have sleep apnea, because we see sleep apnea as a continuum of snoring. And for those who don't know what sleep apnea is, it is um, a disease with a, which is highly prevalent, more in men than in women, that is characterized by pauses in breathing during the night time and these pauses can should be above 10 seconds and they can um, also be accompanied by decrease in oxygen saturation so what happens is um, a person that snores um, as a child or as a young adult may put on weight or with the muscle laxness and um, the mucosa that becomes a little bit more redundant with the um, with age, the, the structures start to collapse. And this causes uh, breathing pauses that will interfere with the daily function of a human being. Because if we can't sleep, then we can't um, properly regenerate. And, and this will have implications both cardiovascular and in the neurological part. So talking about hypertension, we're talking about more increased uh, uh, possibilities of diabetes, of um, high cholesterol. So these are things that will actually implicate everybody in a day-to-day uh, life from all ages. And, um, well, in, in Portugal and the European Union, as I was saying, it's very compartmentalized. Like who will treat what? But if it's a continuum, we have to think that maybe we should, lots of us should be treating um, this disease. And when I mean lots of us, I mean different specialities, like pneumology, which will um, treat with the uh, CPAPs, which I will go into forward um, more ahead in the conversation and the dentists because they'll help with how the maxillar structures are working and how the teeth are orientated and just the the oral cavity and also maxillary surgeons which can also do um, bimax advances those are those people that have retrognathia the people that have um, small jaws they will also tend to, to collapse so what we see is a disease that affects both healthy and not healthy people, all age groups, and that will have a tendency to increase. And that's still very poorly understood by the people and also by different physicians because everyone has a different perspective of how to treat this one disease. So, yes. Yeah, in, the, in the U.S., you, know, you, you have dentists that want to give people oral appliances to advance their lower jaw. Then you have you know sleep doctors that want to give people CPAPs. Then you have like myofunctional people that really want to help with exercises to increase the tone of the, the throat and the tongue and things like that. And then uh, I mean, there's, there's people that evaluate the airway, but um, it takes quite a bit of time to find all these possible solutions. And I don't know of anyone that 
that looks at all the possible solutions and offers them. So it's segmented here too. And that is a problem. And it also, but it's also an opportunity to grow. And um, I think that's what we're doing now. I was in the, the States. I was in New York just uh, two, three weeks ago for the International Sleep Society, Surgical Society. And we had lots of ENTs. We had some um, dentists and some myo. Uh, functional um, people like from physiotherapy or speech therapists, but we do know what we did notice is that there was, I think, no one from pneumology and no one from neurology. So um, I did verify that also in the states it is a problem. But it's in everybody is talking more about the integration, and I think when there's a lacuna, when there's a deficiency, there's also space to grow, and that's actually pretty captivating. Well, true. Is that how you work with? Um with patients? Are you even able to work with patients that way? Or are you forced to be in a narrow range of, um, of therapies to help people? Well, um, I started in sleep surgery, um, maybe, well, on a background, we started off, we start off in the, just from our residency, second year and whatnot. But um, I started doing sleep studies as well, maybe five, four years ago. And at that point, I was I learned how to do most techniques, how to do an oral appliance, how to do um, the CPAP adjustments, um, other than also positional therapies and um, send them to the physical therapist and give plans. But but what I noticed is the more specialized I became, um, the more I wanted to work with others. And I started to find a group of people where I where I work which I can refer to depending on where the patient lives. Because I work in the private practice and I am uh, I'm spread around uh, five clinics around the, the area of Lisbon with a range of, I don't know, 100 kilometers up north and 100 down. And um, in everywhere I work, I try to find good people in every area. And I, I tend to see the patient and I, these, these consultations take a lot longer than a normal consultation. For example, an average ENT consultation is 15 minutes. Unfortunately for these patients, because I like, I want to be very clear about the options that they have. It'll, it'll take about 45. And so I'll, I'll um, tell the patients exactly what to expect from what type of treatment, make sure they understand that half of the success is also on them, which is something that I, I think we need to do a little bit more of instead of giving a magical solution that the patient will then come back to us a little bit um, disappointed. Um, and I try to explain the, the efficacy of the oral appliance is the weight loss. And this is where the patient has most power is the weight loss, the exercise. Uh, I sometimes encourage them to start uh, learning an instrument or singing, something that will also help with the, the, the muscle, the pharyngeal muscles. Um, I'll talk about the various degrees of surgery because now we're talking about multi-level surgery. For example, I'm not sure if you know, Richard, um, for example, nasal surgery is um, fundamental for snoring and sleep apnea. However, it, it's not a total cure. But if we just if we just do the palatal surgery, which is 80% uh, of the, where the obstruction is in, in most cases, if we don't... Um, if we don't treat the nose, it's also be a big failure. So what we have to discuss with the patient is that most of the time it's not one treatment that will work. And most of the time we have to actually do it through phases. And when these less invasive um, options uh, are are completely used, we have to consider others. And but this will also depend on the, the degree of sleep apnea and the anatomy of the patient, the age and comorbidities. For example, I'm never going to uh, propose a surgery for an 80-year-old patient or a 70-year-old. 70, well, they're 70 and they're 70. But 80 above, there's no way a surgery is uh, advisable. But however, I will, this, even though it is not advisable, I will discuss this with the patient and explain what there is available. And this takes time and uh, make sure the patient understands. How often, how often are you able to intervene without surgery or is surgery uh, needed in most cases? Is there any way to, you know, to exercise your throat and your tongue and your diaphragm to, um, to help with snoring and apnea? Or is it, is it really a foregone conclusion that you need CPAP and or surgery, et cetera? Surprisingly enough, um, I've noticed that 
a lot of sleep patients aren't actually good surgical ca candidates. For um, for example, there's various scales which we use. For example, a Friedman classification, which is really old, um, it would tell us the probability. Uh, more or less of success of, um, for example, a palatal surgery. Um, for example, if the patient had huge tonsils, uh, we would say like grade four. This would mean that the tonsils were touching one another. So, like, there's no, there's very little space in the mouth. If uh, he had a, a high palate and a low tongue, the the success would be eighty percent. For example, if the person had a uh, BMI over thirty five, this success rate would decrease to 20%. If the tonsils were small and he had a large tongue, the probability of a palatal surgery would be much lower. So uh, what type of success stories or not success stories do I have? Unfortunately, with age and with, um, and with increased BMI, as surgical success decreases, I propose less and less uh, surgery. And, they, and what we know is that even snoring can be a problem. So myofacial, myofunctional exercises will not be enough for a person that's 110 kilos, for example, and is one meter 50. So uh, if anyone with a BMI over 30, just with myofunctional uh, exercises is not going to do it. It's not going to cut it. Also, a surgery just to remove a little bit of tissue from the pharynx is also not going to cut it because there's deposits of fat everywhere. So the success stories that most shocked me uh, uh, during these last years is how much weight loss impacts surgery, impacts the sleep apnea and snoring. There are patients that are completely cured by losing 10 to 20% of their weight, really depends on where they start off. But they can be completely cured without any need for anything else, just by weight loss. Because the fat will deposit in the tongue and in the pharyngeal walls and in the abdomen. And this will increase the pressure so that the air has a lot of difficulty coming in. When this fat disappears, there's less resistance to the air and there's less loop gain. And this means that, well, the, just, the air just flows much smoother. And also um, remembering that there's less cardiovascular risk because the person has lost weight. Probably their hypertension is more controlled. Um, diabetes can be controlled just by um, proper dieting. And I don't mean restrictive dieting and just being proper, uh, adequate nutrition. And um, so, yes, uh, those success stories are mainly of the importance about weight loss and its uh, role in sleep apnea. What also has a lot of controversy, and this is a, has to do with the, the studies that we've been seeing published in the last 20, 30 years, is how nasal surgery won't impact sleep apnea. Well, they did lots of systematic reviews, and they found out that if, although nasal surgery does increase um, well-being and the qualitative um, aspects of sleeping, so the person will feel that they have a more refreshed and reparative sleep, the actual values of the sleep apnea do not decrease a lot. And so what we're talking when we talk about the values of the sleep apnea, we're talking about a sleep apnea hypopnea index. And this index is defined of how many events occur in an hour. For it to be considered sleep apnea, you have to have four, more than five events per hour and um, comorbidities or uh, sleep symptoms such as daytime sleepiness, irritability, um, depressive, sy um, depressive symptoms. And above, if you do not have any of these symptoms or comorbidities, no one is going to treat you in between an AHI of 5 and 15. And even uh, some new meta-analysis from the Hypnolaus study, I think it's from the Northern Europe uh, I think it's Switzerland. I need to I need to check. But the Hypnolaus study they found that around thirty to forty percent of the population of healthy people, men and women, had um, an AHI of around fifteen. So is it increasing? Because before this was around ten to twenty percent. So is it increasing now, or are the the ways we measure the AHI more sensitive? Or do we need to really be treating all patients that have some degree of sleep apnea in the absence of symptoms or comorbidities? That's still a little bit to be defined. 
but definitely between 15 and 30 of an AHI. That means 15 to 30 events per hour. A person has a moderate sleep apnea. And this person, if we can get them under 15 or under 10, depending on the classifications, we can consider them almost cured. Uh, a person that has an AHI of 30 will have a more harder time becoming cured because they have a lot, lot more events per hour. And these are the patients that we uh, normally treat with CPAP as it's the gold standard. However, no one is going to treat a person who has huge tonsils and is young with, a, with an AHI of 30 with a CPAP because that's just, that's just sending him the life of um, something completely avoidable. But going back onto the nasal surgery, the controversy. So um, what they did is that they analyzed the differences in AHI, the number of events, the respiratory events after nasal surgery and before. And they found that the index decreased maybe two to three to four values. So for someone who has an AHI of 30, going from 30 to 26 is not significant. So it, gives, it gave us ENTs a bad reputation. However, I have had actual patients that have had an AHI of 30 or 24 or 26 and that have gone up to four. Why is this? Sometimes it's the resistance. Sometimes it's the, the arousal limit. If the person is breathing better through the nose, they'll wake up. And if the person is very sensitive to their own snoring and the limitation, they'll wake up less. Or maybe the first study wasn't well done. This is also a possibility because the sleep studies can be, even though there's a little bit of variation between night to night, it can be very different depending on the type of sleep study and with whom you perform it. And the classifications may vary. So sometimes we think that there's not been a much of a cure or actually the patient has gotten worse, but sometimes it all has to do about the classification and where you're doing it. So it really is important to work with a sleep lab that you know is of is trustworthy and how they're classifying the, the sleep events. So in the last two the patients... Index, or, 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 you only look, or you're looking at the other symptoms the person has? You, know, what you have to look at everything. 20 down, to, 20 down to 15, is that a failure or a success? Well, uh, if you, the surgical... Um, it depends on what we're talking about. If you're talking about surgical criteria of success, there's a SIR classification, which is um, a 50% reduction and of the AHI and also uh, an AHI lower than 10 or 15, depending on the, the classification you use. So a person with no symptoms and an AHI of 15 without uh, below 15, so maybe 14.9, <laughs> below without any symptoms or comorbidities, with a no hypertension, for me, that would be a cure. But the patient that will continue to have symptoms, and, and this is what we're treating. We're treating people. We're not treating numbers. So a patient with symptoms, even if, it has a, if they have a low HI, I will still consider it a relative failure. And that means that we still need to invest and find a way to, to make this, patient, this person better. And so this is it where... Seems uh, like a, we'll it seems like injury. a hard cutoff. You know, is it, so the cutoff is not 15? It's 15 plus the symptoms plus the comorbidities or... Does it all boil into a matrix by which you uh, <clears throat> decide how to treat someone or when they're quote unquote cured? Okay. The the one definitive no controversy um, index and value cutoff is above 30, CPAP is gold standard. Below 30, it's questionable. Between 15 and 30, irrespective of the symptoms, we have many options available and all of them can probably give a, a good decrease of the AHI. Between 5 and 15, where you can be fine. Between 5 and 15 is when the patient is dependent on the symptoms and the comorbidities. Between 15 and 30, there's lots of treatment available. Above 30, CPAP first, and then consider the anatomical aspects and the patient's uh, necessities. Right, so I see. It's groupings. Okay. Well, yeah, go ahead. Continue on. So how uh, your method is ah. to... Find out what neighborhood that they're in, they're in, and then uh, look at the basket of treatments and kind of craft a, a personalized plan from there. Exactly, the key word is personalized, and um, there, there's new techniques that we have now for this personalization. For um, before, we used to have um, a simple radiograph of uh, uh, X-ray where we would measure the bony structure and we would have our own observation. But now we have CT scans and CT scans that we can do um, some three-dimensional 
uh, analysis of the upper airway and understand exactly what point is their collapse. And uh, is this behind the hard palate, the soft palate, the tongue? Is it the epiglottis? Uh, is it the nose? We also have, because this is inf information that will help us um, treat the anatomical disorders through either surgery or oral appliances. Um, CPAP is irrelevant of, of all this because it's just a, an air compressor that you just adapt to the nose or, or a face mask and you don't need the, these sort of studies. But what is new, okay, not really new, but what's fallen again into popularity is something called DICE, the drug-induced sleep endoscopy. I'm not sure you've heard of this, Richard, have you? No, what is that? It sounds dicey. Okay. Just... Uh, a drug-induced uh, sleep endoscopy was... Um, it was developed in the, the 1980s, and it was uh, what we you do is you give a, a sedating drug, like for example propofol or midazolam. These are drugs that anesthetists use for induction of sleep. And um, what you do is you um, control it until the patient is snoring. You put the levels on to see the patient snore, and then you can also control it with the an sort of simplified EEG called the BIS, and that will tell you at what level the, the patient is in their sleep. And then you, you place an endoscope, an ENT endoscope. It's not like the gastroenterologist endoscope. It's a really thin milli millimetric endoscope through the nose. And you observe how the heart, the soft palate will collapse, the velopharynx. And so we can see real time while the patient is snoring without, um, with just the drugs, but simulating a normal sleep. And we can see if the, the palate will completely collapse, if it flutters, if this collapse is anterior posterior, or if it's uh, concentric. And we've also found that there are patterns to this type of collapse that may estimate, that will give an, a prognosis of how efficacious a surgery or a certain, um, for example, oral appliance will be in increasing the airway. So going further down through the velopharynx, we'll then observe the lateral oropharyngeal walls. This includes the tonsils or just the, the fatty pharyngeal deposits. And we can observe also the lateral collapse if it's total or partial or if there's no collapse you can observe the tongue base because during the wake time the tongue base is is the one of the structures the tongue base and the epiglottis are two structures that are not well um, exemplified during the wake patient because they're very tonic they're in place you can never see a collapse in an awake patient of these areas meanwhile for the palate it's a little bit easier to understand what type of a collapse they'll have so while the patient is snoring, we can see that the tongue may slide backwards and there may be a hypertrophy of the, the um, lingual tonsils. I'm not sure you know this, that we have five types of tonsils in our mouth. The palatine oh, tonsils are the, 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 yes, it's, it's normal, but it's, it's the lymphoid tissue. So it's immune, uh, immune tissue that we have that will, will, will help us with um our immune system. So we have the palatine tonsils that are the, the normal tonsils that everyone takes out when they're young or if they have infections, recurrent tonsillitis and whatnot. But we also, when the people, for example, take their tonsils out earlier on, they may grow the, their uh, lingual tonsils. And so these are the back, at the back of the tongue and that they may grow so large that they even push the epiglottis back or they may even go, uh, they grow um, even larger than the epiglottis, and then you can barely see it through this uh, technique. So during uh, DICE, during the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, we can see if the, the tongue base is elevated, if it's just a muscular uh, hypertrophy, if it's pushing back the epiglottis. We can see if the epiglottis, which is a cartilage that's shaped like a, a tennis racket, and that will protect the upper airway, when, for example, when we're eating, this during nighttime, if it's floppy, it may fall backwards, or if there's increased resistance, just like in a tube, like in a straw. Imagine you're um, sipping um, a drink through a straw. If this plastic the straw is a little bit more malleable it, and you suck too hard, it'll all collapse. And that's what happens with the epiglottis. If there's a lot of negative pressure, the epiglottis may shut back like a trapdoor and may occlude the upper airway. But these last uh, two signs, the, the tongue base obstruction, especially the epiglottis, are things that will 
usually um, a few years back, they were not being treated because they were not being identified. And that's also what gave a lot of failure to our, our surgeries and gave ENT a bad name. But now that we've um, started to understand that there's more obstruction beyond the nose and the soft palate, um, we can increase our surgical success. Also during DICE, what we can do is we can also simulate the the person snoring on their side by either rotating their head to one side and the other, rotating the, rotating the body, seeing the differences that impacts the upper airway, and also doing a chin lift, which is you push the mandibular, you pull it a little bit forward, like one centimeter forward with your, with your fingers, and that will simulate an oral appliance. And we can see the structures the velopharynx, the lateral pharyngeal walls, the tongue base and the epiglottis, how much they will open up or not. Or sometimes they even change the configuration. They move from a concentric collapse to an anteroposterior. Or, and this will tell us, will the patient treated by this form, will the patient stop snoring? Will they stop having this collapse? And most of the time, what we find is that usually these patients will need a combination of therapies. It's a bit like hypertension is nowadays. You don't have, most patients don't take just one pill. In fact, most pills are now actually a combination of two, of a diuretic and a, um, an ACE inhibitor, uh, which is a, a type of enzyme. So these, um, these new ways of diagnosing these type of patients will help us increase our surgical success and also our overall treatment plan. Yes. So the, the kind of the gold standard under under anesthetic and under observation is to uh, is to do the dice uh, evaluation and then see if certain therapies will work. Unfortunately, not many people um, still do the dice. It is catching on. Uh, I remember a few years back, three or four years ago, here in Portugal, a lot of not a lot of people were talking about dice. At the time, I um, I had gone to uh, Holland and I performed dice with Nico de Vries and his team in Amsterdam. They've been doing it for years and years and years. They do, I don't know, 20 per per week. Um, they usually do it on Mondays at 10 in the morning, 10 in the evening. So you do, you, you see a lot. And uh, also in Belgium, in Antwerp, it's a really, these are really good centers, European references. And... Um, what you saw is here in Portugal, it was a bit of a difficulty because dice, in knee, you need to do it on a patient that will have a high card cardiovascular risk because most sleep apnea patients have high card cardiovascular risks. They have hypoxemias, which means that they desaturate. And at the first impression, these are a little bit, it's a little bit scary for anesthetists. So to convince them, and it's also not complement, complicate, I, um, it's not usually included in most insurance plans. So it was hard to get to start doing this. So it's not really the gold standard yet, even though any sleep doctor who considers them a proper sleep doctor, especially ENT, should include a DICE evaluation on their patient right before surgery or even before surgery just to discuss the treatment plans with the patient. Yeah, I've never heard of this kind of evaluation before. So it uh, must not be catching on nearly as much as it should. No, so but how, it will. How much do you feel like this improves the efficacy of, of subsequent treat, treatments when you do the dice evaluation versus not that's, doing it? That's very interesting. That's actually um, a topic of a lot of articles lately in the past five to three years is how much uh, dice is actually affecting our successes and our, our failures. Um, there's a problem with the dice is that it may lead to overtreatment because what we may see in the tongue base and the epiglottis, um, these collapses may be in due to increased resistance. And if you just treat the nose and the soft palate, um, most of the collapses in front, um, the, the tongue base and the epiglottis actually disappear. Um, this really does differ from the sleep center to sleep center. In some, it actually helps. In others, uh, it changes nothing. I think it's just it's more of information to protect ourselves and the patient. Most of the time, the the anatomical and the um, the anatomical factors that will lead for our surgical treatment or or not for the neural appliance uh, are usually very obvious at the beginning. So. For the palate and the, the nose, dice will not change much of our perspective. For the epiglottis and the tongue base, it will. 
but maybe it's actually should be reserved for why uh, when the first surgery does not work when the patient continues to snore after you've done a palatal surgery and a nasal surgery so i think it's more of a a backup and it's not quite a predictor because as i said it may confuse us and give us obstructions that aren't actually that relevant and that may make us overtreat and do more invasive surgery than actually we should. Okay. It's it's well, very controversial. The, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean it's hard to figure it out. It's a complicated problem and uh, <clears throat> I mean there's better diagnosis, there's better treatment, there's better evaluation and I mean it well, another question here is how much follow up is there? So once someone gets an oral appliance or a CPAP uh, is the person even evaluated to see if their you know, AHI goes down or if uh, they're sleeping better? Or is it just, you know, the person, uh, as long as they're feeling somewhat better, they don't come back to the doctor and that's the last you hear of them. I mean, how much follow-up is there with people once they're, uh, they've gotten a surgery or they've, got, they've gotten some kind of treatment? Well, a sleep apnea patient is actually a, sleep, is a patient for life. Uh, <laughs> really, it is hard. The, um, for an oral appliance, it is important that there's a follow-up. Uh, the first few months and weeks is a little bit. The timing is shorter. I'm not a med, uh, I'm not a dentist, so and I've only done it a few times in, in the in the beginning of my practice. I think it's I send my patients and I refer them most to, well, to you, medical dentists because I think it's better. Good question. But with, these patients. With CPAPs, with CPAPs, you say that they're a medical patient for their life, but when do they come back and do another sleep study? The CPAP um, patient, they should be seen after the first month because that's the, when there's most um, failure or uh, success in the compliance. And that first month is also important to see what optimal pressures and to identify any um, air leaks from the face mask. And then after that, after three months again, and then when once it is stabilized, six to six months for renewal also for the insurance. And when should they repeat their sleep study? Honestly, they should only repeat their sleep study if there's an anatomical change, if either by surgery or by weight loss. And if they do lose, for example, 10% of their weight, I would suggest to do another sleep study. Um, for uh, oral appliance um, patients, also the, the same. The first month is important. Then uh, the first two weeks, in fact, for titration, because your oral appliance is only 70 you only advance it 70% of your maximum uh, advancement width uh, length. So imagine if you put your jaw, your lower jaw out forward and you do it three times, you can see what your maximum uh, amplitude is of uh, jaw thrust. And then you take 70 to 60% of that jaw thrust and that's the percentage you're going to use on your oral appliance and then you have lots of oral appliances you have ones that can be titrated by the patient so the patient can put um, after two weeks go millimeter to millimeter forward or backward if it's uncomfortable for the atm the tmj the temporomandibular joint that's the joint we have that connects our mandibular bone to our ear bone for useful for talking and eating and so the patient can titrate this or the medical dentist can do this and as, as Just like the CPAP, first month is important, then first three months, depending on how the titration is going. And then when you're at maximum, um, maximum advancement, then you do a sleep study. Meanwhile, with the CPAP, it's not necessary because with the CPAP, you can know what the residual AHI, the machine will tell you. So you don't need to do another sleep study unless the patient changes their anatomical status. For surgery, when would we do it? We would do it around uh, six months after surgery. That's the most uh, um, that's the the most correct way because uh, the first um, the first few months, for example, with palatal surgery and tonsil surgery, the person will lose a lot of weight. However, this weight may be just temporary, and also there's a lot of scarring in the palatal uh, region, and so it's still. I'm going to retract more and there's going to be more space. So after six months, we will know the patient will have their weight more stabilized because it's also frequent. When they lose weight, they become better, but then they'll have a rebound of a increased appetite and then they'll just put on that weight they lost and maybe some more. And so at six months, it's, uh, it's safe to say that that's my, sort of stable. And so then you do another sleep study to find out what's your next move.
Um, let me see what for other. Of, uh, what percentage of patients uh, stop complying with their treatment? I mean, surgery, you know, that doesn't make sense, but CPAP or. Yeah, with surgery, you have 100% compliance. CPAP is the one, is the, the form of treatment which has less compliance, but it, then again, it really does depend on this, uh, the sleep center. I've seen reports between 60% to, for example, this uh, center we have here with the Prasoda Teresa Paiva. Um, it's a, a medical sleep lab of reference here in Lisbon. She's got percentages of 80 to 90% of success. But then again, she's, uh, her team, they're, they have a really close accompaniment with these patients. So the, the adherence is increased and the compliance is increased. For example, uh, mandibular or mandibular advancement devices, their compliance is uh, better than CPAP. It's usually at the 50, 60, 70 percent. But it really does depend on the center that you're studying. But CPAP usually does not have a good compliance, especially the younger the patient is, uh, for obvious reasons. And let me see. Well, but what, there's what are also... the reasons that it doesn't have good compliance? And when does the non-compliance happen? In the beginning? Or the people that make it through the, the titration first month. process for the first month, do the they first have month much is, higher is compliance? terrible. Yes, usually it's because of there's too much air coming out of the mask, or because the the person is really um, anxious, and sometimes they just need some medication the first few two weeks. Or sometimes a lot of patients have, with sleep apnea have, for example, insomnia, especially the women, and these two things come accompanied. So you have to kind of treat the insomnia and the sleep apnea at the same time, and both of them will get better treating one and the other. And so for these patients, they will need a little bit of a CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and a little bit of sometimes medication so that they can adjust to the CPAP. Because if you're 30 minutes waiting to fall asleep and then you have a machine that starts, starts to turn on, well, the machine usually starts at 30 minutes depending on the, pro the program. The program. But um, So the first month is actually the worst month and is when you need uh, more accompaniment but there are treatment plans that we've also not discussed here and i would like to to make them clear there's positional treatment for example there's um there's these devices that you can put either on your chest or for example strapped on your neck or even on your pillow or on your mattress that will vibrate according to the the sounds of snoring and these devices for example coupled with another treatment like for example all oral appliances can be effective in people with AHIs of 15 to 30 and can be effective in patients that are CPAP failures and there's also another appliance called um, the hypoglossal nerve stimulator do you know what this is yeah I heard of it it, but it shocks your tongue in a way when you stop breathing to make you uh, create the breathing yes it, it doesn't quite shock it stimulates but yes i see what you're going um there's two hypoglossal nerve stimulators one is connected to your coastal uh, muscles uh, so your rib cage and so it will stimulate the muscle the tongue muscle when you're breathing and then open it and then there's another that it's a cuff around the the nerve of the tongue muscle only then it will activate it in random patterns not quite random, but um, program, programmed patterns that will make the tongue protrude and increase the space in a cyclic form. This is a treatment that is um, as successful as CPAP and as successful as maxillar uh, BIMAX, which is a mandibular maxillar advancements. And these are strong ma um, maxillofacial surgeries. So the neuro hypoglossal nerve stimulator is a really efficacious treatment. However, it does have a, a small, a short indication list. Not all patients are actually candidates. These patients have to be CPAP failures. So first you have to try the gold standard. They have to be patients that are not too obese because then it may not work. They have to have patients that will not have such a concentric collapse in uh, in dice so these patients have to have a dice for at least one of the neurostimulators it is a part of the protocol for the other it's still in development if if this concentric collapse will um uh, will define the success or not and um they also cannot have many central apneas these are apneas with not because uh, provoked not because of the obstruction but actually from a neurological point of view and usually are associated with other forms of disease 
So I really, it's important also to understand that these two sorts of treatments are also available and are also offered um, for the patients. Positional therapy is especially important for those that are starting to snore and that they're with a, a mild sleep apnea, because what we know is that mild sleep apnea begins more put in a positional way. And this means that the person does not have apnea when they're sleeping on their side, but when they're belly up, they start to, to sleep apnea. So these will be maybe younger patients and they will then, as they uh, put on weight and as they grow older and their mucosa becomes more flaccid and their muscles uh, also more flaccid, that the, they will develop into a not a positional sleep apnea. Okay. Well, very good. So what, what's the best way for people to uh, start to figure out, you know, what causes them not to sleep well or feel tired or irritable? What, you know, what's kind of the path for them? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, first to get a good sleep doctor, <laughs> um, that person would have to, it, it's important to have someone that will integrate all the information, but also look for teamwork, um, look for a center that will work with others or for a doctor that will work with others, because it's important to have, um, these things available. Um, this could start off as with an ENT. This could also start off with a neurologist, a pneumologist, but it's important that the patient ask, okay. What if I want to see my other options, for example, neural appliance uh, or surgery? What do you have to offer and what can we do about it? But most patients, as the, at the beginning, and this goes for all specialities, uh, most patients will undergo a sleep study that should be a level one or two. With, this is with the EEG, and this will tell us the, the sort of sleep phases and will also help differentiate other problems with, um, other than sleep apnea. For example, sometimes we think a person has sleep apnea, but they actually, they may have narcolepsy. And it's really hard with just um, a simple sleep study, those, those, the simple ones, the simplified ones to, to identify this. Um, so sleep study, a CT scan of the pharynx and of the nose, and this anyone can order. It doesn't matter what speciality, but if they do have uh, large tonsils, if they look in the mirror and they look at their mouth and they see large tonsils or a long palate, or they notice that they they don't breathe properly with, at night, they breathe with their mouth open, they will definitely need an ENT. Not necessarily for surgery, but they'll need an evaluation to also um, discuss other comorbidities, for example, allergic rhinitis. We all know that when we are um, we have the flu or our nose is blocked for another reason, we all tend to snore. Even those, even the skinniest, non-collapsible people may snore in the right conditions. So if there are other comorbidities that need to be addressed, it's also important to have these controlled. Okay, very good. What's the best way for people to, uh, again, you told them how to find out more if they have an issue, but how do they get in touch with you or uh, your lab or your practice that they are local to you or they have questions? Well, um, I'm online um, in I guess if I if you want I can you can leave my email and they can send uh, the questions to my email. Um, I'm also in many sleep clinics here in Lisbon. You just put your my name on Google and it'll appear. It's pretty easy. I have a fairly open agenda, especially in the smaller clinics. Um, every time there's patients, I just go. <laughs> so actually, it's not really difficult to get in contact with me. Um, I'm also on Instagram and in Facebook, so any messages that I can see and that I can reply and help, I'm available for for discussion. Okay. Well, that's great, Joanna. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you, Richard, for this wonderful hour. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, 
regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.